<clears throat> All right, so now we'll study properties of charges. So what we have learned so far is that um, um, in nature, there are two kinds of charges, positive and negative charges. Like charges repel each other, unlike charges attract each other. Uh, the magnitude of the force between them is given by Coulomb's law and it's uh, proportional to the product of the charges and inversely proportional to the distance squared. Now, Mr. Milliken in the 1900s found out that um, charge is quantized. Okay, and we'll see what that means. But here's an interesting fact. So here's the charge of the electron, which is minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, and by the way, the unit is named after Mr. Coulomb, who discovered the Coulomb's law. And the charge of the proton is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And you see, the mass of the proton is 10 to the minus 27 kg, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kg. The electron mass is 10 to the minus 31 kg. <clears throat> All right, so let me... Yeah, so, well, eventually we'll talk about this, but anyway, a proton is made of three quarks, uh, uh, I believe two ups and one down or something like that, you can Google it. The electron is a, is a fundamental particle. There is no substructure to it as far as we know, okay? This guy is 2000 times heavier than the electron, okay? So mass of the proton is about 2000 times the mass of the electron. So they're not related. I mean, they're very different particles, but their charges are exactly equal to each other. They're, uh, the magnitude of the charges are exactly equal to each other. So that's a very <clears throat> um, interesting fact. And how do we know that? Well, you can take a uh, handful of dirt. You can walk outside, take a handful of dirt, and there's... Uh, trillions and trillions of electrons in it and trillions and trillions of protons in it and the charge of that handful of dirt is exactly zero and so that's how we know okay. that the charges are exactly equal to each other all right so <clears throat> um, mr melkin he did this experiment and found that the charge is quantized and here is a uh, he won a nobel prize for this experiment uh, uh, so let's see how this experiment was done. Okay. All right, so it's called an oil drop experiment. So here is an oil spritzer. You spritz oil in here. And it turns out that the terminal velocity of these oil droplets depends on the mass of the oil droplet. Okay. And now let's uh, turn on an electric field. Okay, so um, again, so what Mr. O, uh, Milken did was he spritzed, he sprayed some oil droplets. Oops, um, okay, so we'll do it again. Spray some oil droplets. And he watched these guys measure their terminal velocity. So once they're falling down at constant velocity, they've reached terminal velocity. He measured their terminal velocity from them. From that, he got their mass. And now look at this droplet. Okay. So this droplet is at rest. Okay. So let's see what is happening on that droplet. So <clears throat> where is So that droplet was at rest. There's a gravitational force on it. And he remember had uh, uh, turned on an electric field in that direction. And uh, you'll see that, um, oops, actually the electric field was in this direction. Okay. And what happened was uh, he, so this droplet got a negative charge and the electrostatic force on it was E times E in that direction. Okay, 
or Q times C, we don't know the charge, Q times E. So that's the charge on that. And so Q times E was equal to mass times gravity. Remember he got this from the terminal velocity. Okay. And so Q was MG divided by E. Okay. He got this from the terminal velocity. We know this, he knew the electric field from the voltage he applied and he could calculate the charge in the oil droplet. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, and he did thousands of these, ex uh, he did observations on thousands of these droplets. Okay, so let's do it again. Uh, spritz the oil drop, oops. So here's the oil droplets from the terminal velocity, get their mass, turn on an electric field. And um, so for this droplet, um, um, and you could change the charge on it by shining x-rays and so on. But anyway, so this, the electric force, electrostatic force is balanced, balancing the gravitational force on this guy. Okay. And so, as I showed you, he could calculate the charge on each of them. So the mass of the oil droplet is related to terminal velocity. Shining x-rays in the lower chamber ionizes the air. Some of these charges attach to the oil droplet. So you can measure the charge on <clears throat> the oil droplet. And every time what he got was an integer multiple times this fundamental charge. Okay. So the smallest charge you could have was E. and uh, um, the charge on the oil droplet was always quantized. It was either 1E, 2Es, 3E, and so on. Okay. All right. <clears throat> all right, well, I mean, we study all of this because uh, there are problems to be solved out there in the real world. Uh, as engineers, we have to do that. And so here's a, a problem. So for instance, so here's a factory that's spewing out uh, <clears throat> um, quite bad smoke. So for instance, uh, uh, if you were living anywhere close to this factory, uh, respiratory illnesses are, um, would be quite common. Okay. So how do you remove the smoke? How do you clean up the smoke? Okay. So uh, here's a similar factory without that smoke. So how does that happen? Okay, so here is the structure. Uh, so imagine these are large metal plates and there are wires. So there are layers of these plates and there are wires going through the plates. I mean, in between the gaps of the plates. Okay. And uh, the wires are given a negative potential and the metal plates are given a positive potential. So let me do a drawing. Let's. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going giving a cut cut out view. So here are the large metal plates, and here are the wires coming between the plates. Okay, and what you've done is uh, connected a large negative voltage to the wires and the positive voltage to this thing. Okay. And the smoke goes through here. Yeah. So the smoke has uh, these particles. Okay. And when the smoke goes near the wires, these negative wires they'll give uh, <clears throat> they'll they'll give up electrons easily. Okay. So electrons, these guys become negatively charged. The smoke particles. And remember, these plates were positively charged, so these small particles that are negatively charged will get attracted to these metal plates you know, and stick there. And that's how you remove all the particulate matters from the smoke. Okay, so these are called electrostatic precipitators. Uh, so, and it consists of a series of wires and plates. Uh, the wires are held at high negative. <coughs> uh, uh, voltage and 
particles passing near the wire pick up negative charges and stick to the positive plates. The accumulated particles are peri periodically shaken off. Okay. So uh, these electrostatic precipitators can remove over 99% of the part particulate matters, and that's what's happened here. Okay. So, um, and uh, that is, um, that solved a lot of health issues in the surrounding areas. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now we'll briefly talk about um, your copy machines, how they work. And uh, these copy machines depend on something called the photoconducting material that you saw in this application. So here's a photoconducting material. Um, remember, um, <clears throat> So let's uh, let's reset this. How do I reset this? Hmm. Okay. So here's a photoconducting material. <clears throat> so here's a photoconducting material. In a photoconducting material, this band is full, and right now it cannot conduct electricity. So, so for instance, if I play, it cannot, it will not conduct electricity, because to conduct electricity, remember you need <clears throat> you need uh, empty levels for electrons, and right now these electrons cannot access these empty levels. But that can be fixed by if you can excite these electrons in there, then they could they would have empty levels and they could conduct electricity. So now let's shine light on them. And that's what the light does. It excites electrons and now suddenly this material has become conducting. Okay. As soon as you stop shining light, it won't conduct electricity anymore. Okay. So that's a photoconducting material. <clears throat> Selenium is a photoconducting material. So here's how the photocopying process works. You coat, you coat this metal drum with selenium. Okay. And uh, here's the sheet that you're photocopying. You shine a light through there. Wherever light fell, uh, oh, by the way, and then you coated the selenium with uh, a positive charge. Okay, so that's what that's shown. Uh, so you, you coated the drum with uh, photoconducting material, then you coated the selenium with positive charges, and then you show when you shine light on this paper, wherever light fell, selenium became photoconducting and all that charge leaked away because the base was a metal. Uh, the charge leaked away. Wherever light didn't fall, that was still positively charged and then you sprinkle it with negatively charged toner. And then you bring a warm piece of paper and the toner is transferred to the paper. Okay, so that's how you make a photocopy. Photocopy. Uh, a laser printer works similarly. So there's the, your prep work. There's an initial drum. And in a laser printer, when you send out a print job, all the the driver, what it does is it tells the laser when to turn on and off, okay? So rather than doing that, there's a laser that scans the drum and it turns on and off at appropriate times. And then there's the, there's the portion that uh, needs to be printed, okay? So, and once the laser has scanned the drum, you sprinkle this with toner and then transfer it to a paper, okay? So that's how a copy machine works. <clears throat> um, well, I, I guess we'll skip the inkjet printer. This is a, all right. Um, so I don't know if any of you guys have used an inkjet printer, but uh, so here's a interesting thing. So drops are shot from the uh, generator about 100 drops per character. So if the in 
inkjet printer printed this thing, this sheet, it would take a hundred drops to uh, print uh, G, for instance, or A, or whatever. Okay. And uh, okay, so let's. Uh, oops. Okay, so <clears throat> let's say here is an ink draw and you give it a charge. So you're giving it two times the electric charge, uh, two times E, and then you launch it. <clears throat> and so you note the deflection there, okay? So it got deflected that much. Yeah. And the ink drop hit that portion of the paper. Now let's uh, reduce the charge to one E. So with the two E charge, the ink drop hit that portion of the paper. And with a one E charge, oh, let's see. No, no. With the one E charge, it, the ink drop hit that portion of the paper. All right, so, <clears throat> so here are the paper you're printing on. These are the deflecting plates, and you saw that the deflecting plates are, um, well, they're essentially capacitor plates. Uh, they're <clears throat> charged plates, so they're, you apply a potential to them. And uh, so when you each, so, <clears throat> To one print one character, you're sending out a hundred droplets. You have to put the appropriate charge on the uh, droplet, depending on where on the paper you want to print them, and so on. Okay, so the inkjet printer is quite a piece of technology. Okay, so input signals from the computer controls the charge given to each drop, and thus how much each drop is deflected um, by the plates. Okay. So it's really an amazing piece of technology. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pause again because we are going to start a different topic now. We'll talk about electric fields. And so 